Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Pakistan quietly convicts 26 11 terror attacks mastermind Sajid Meer. Ahead of Amarnath Yatra, three Lashkar terrorists killed in Jammu and Kashmir. And Taliban seek recognition but offer no concessions to international concerns. After years of denying his presence and even claiming he was dead, Pakistan now claims that 26-11 Mumbai attacks conspirator Sajid Majid Mir is in their custody and has been sentenced to 15 years in jail over a terror financing case. This decision of course comes as Pakistan is eyeing the listing from the Financial Action Task Force's International Terror Financing Watch List. A report. India's wanted terrorist and the main handler in the 26-11 Mumbai attack, which shook the entire world, Sajid Majid Mir, who was once declared dead by Pakistan, has been sentenced by a court in Lahore. An anti-terrorism court in Lahore handed down over 15 years jail term to the lashkar e taiba terrorist Sajid Mir in a terror financing case. The court has also imposed a fine of over 4 lakh Pakistani rupees on Mir. He was arrested in the month of April and since then has been kept in Lahore Central Jail. The Counter-Terrorism Department of the Punjab Police, which often issues convictions of the suspects in such cases to the media, did not notify Mir's conviction. The country has been trying to convince the Financial Action Task Force to get off the grey list and Sajid Mir has been its biggest trump card. Pakistan uses cross-border terrorism and the homegrown terrorists for achieving its foreign policy objectives. So they are an instrument of its foreign policy. And therefore, as and when under international pressure or the pressure of the FATF, it does try to contain them, tries to pro forma, arrest them. It has happened before. We have seen in uh, so many years, it was four decades now. So it's a history keeps on repeating and once again you will see it as soon as the heat is off Pakistan because see if they are really keen then why are they waiting for all these thousands of uh, well-known notorious terrorists straddling across their land. The silent conviction and sentencing of Sajid Mir is a desperate measure by Pakistan to extricate itself from the FATF watch list. Islamabad has acted this way in the past too. As earlier this year, Hafiz Said, founder of the Lashkar e Taiba terror outfit, on whom the US has placed 10 million US dollars bounty, was sentenced to 31 years in jail ahead of the FATF plenary meeting in Paris. The jail sentence of Mir after Hafiz Said comes as a part of the plan to placate FATF. This is just a show put on by Pakistan for global spectators. As in the past, Islamabad denied his presence and even claimed him dead. According to a report of the United States government in 2019, Mir was widely believed to reside in Pakistan under the protection of the state despite government denials. Not only Sajid Mir, but Pakistan is also home to 12 foreign terror organizations, five being India centric, including Lashkar e Taiba and Jaish e Muhammad. U.S. officials have also identified Pakistan as a base of operations for numerous armed and non-state terror groups, some of which have existed since the 1980s. Financing of terror groups, closing their accounts, we have seen in the past what has happened. But at the moment, since uh, they have been under rigorous uh, control, or at least uh, an observation by the FATF, and have been on the grey list for a long time. Uh, they are apparently going to get out of it now because as per the reports from the FATF, they are trying to comply with as many uh, uh, points uh, or observations as possible. Uh, that is good actually if, that, if there is an independent verification and the international body is fully satisfied of this action. If that does not happen, 
then they can hoodwink anyone. And but Pakistan must remember that going by the terrorist path and then claiming to be a victim of it is something that is not going to hold much water for too long for them. Pakistan's list of actionable points shared with FATF is a smokescreen to show its commitment to combating terror, while the reality is that the country remains a safe haven for terrorists and terror financing activities. The biggest example is that no action has been taken against Tala Saeed, son of 2611 mastermind Hafiz Saeed, who is the new face of Jamaat Uddawa. According to intelligence agencies, Tala is next in line to take over functions of JUD, the parent body of the globally proscribed terror outfit lashkar e taiba Despite mounting proof of Pakistan's role in international terrorism sponsorship, the country has taken no significant counter-terrorism measures on its turf. In truth, Islamabad has taken cosmetic measures prior to each plenary session of the global watchdog FATF, which has kept Pakistan on its grey list for failing to curb money laundering and terror financing. Superficial steps are taken to get off the grey list of FATF while the country remains a hotbed of terrorism in reality. Moving on, recent weeks in Kashmir have witnessed a spike in targeted killings of Kashmiri Hindus and most of them were shot by hybrid terrorists. They are the unlisted radicalized persons who carry out terrorist strikes and slips back into their routine life. Security forces are considering them as a new threat and challenge in the valley. Recently, Jammu and Kashmir police apprehended one hybrid terrorist and neutralized two other Lashkar terrorists in the Kulgam district of Kashmir. A report. Ever since targeted civilian killings rattled Jammu and Kashmir, the region has been hearing about a new kind of combatant known as hybrid militants. Security forces in Kashmir are facing a new challenge on the militancy front. The presence of hybrid militants who are not listed as ultras, but persons radicalized enough to carry out a terror strike and then slip back into the routine life, often without leaving any trace. Over the past few weeks, the attacks on soft targets in the valley have witnessed a spike. Most of these incidents have been carried out by the pistol-born youth who are not listed as militants with the security agencies. Recently, on 29th June, Indian security forces apprehended one hybrid terrorist in Kashmir's Bandipura district. The forces also seized arms and ammunition, including material to make improvised explosive devices. Pakistan Army, they've changed their tactics and instructed all their overground and underground workers now to carry on targeted killings and looking at soft targets so that a fierce psychosis is set up in the valley. Because right now, as things stand, People are feeling very free over there, especially after the abrogation of Article 370 in 2019. The people feel that now they are integrated with India and there is nothing to fear. But this fear that is being put into them is by the overground, underground workers who have been instructed by Pakistan ISI to carry on these killings. There are some challenges with regard to hybrid terrorism. Identifying hybrid terrorists is a big challenge and to arrest them or stop them from doing any unlawful activities. If that's not possible, then neutralizing them in encounters is a big challenge. Security officials in Jammu and Kashmir say that hybrid terrorism could pose a biggest challenge for year 2022. They are spreading their network all across the valley. After the spate of encounters in the Kashmir Valley in recent months, Indian security forces have intensified their anti-terrorist operations and engaged in back-to-back -back encounters across the region. Recently, Indian security forces neutralized two lashkar e taiba terrorists from the Naupura region of Kulgam district. Security forces launched a cordon and search operation at Naupura Kherpura in the Trubji area of the district 
after getting information about the presence of terrorists there. The security forces question scores of youngsters who were suspected to be overground workers of terrorists. In totality, Indian security forces killed 170 terrorists in 70 encounters this year. This included 33 foreign terrorists, mostly from Pakistan. The Indian state has been able to counter it very well and not only counter it, but today in the Pakistan occupied Kashmir area, people are there saying that they want to come back, they want to join the Indian state. They want that, they want that the Indian state should rule them and not the Pakistan government. This shows that what Pakistan tried to do through this Operation Topak, they have failed in it. The people, they thought would rise against the Indian state, they have not. In fact, today, if you see, most of the arrests and most of the uh, encounters that are taking place is because that the locals are informing uh, the security forces of any militants that are hiding around anywhere. And especially so that in case when these targeted killings take place, the hybrid militant is also identified through the locals. The new trend is happening in the valley on the directions of Pakistan and its spy agency, the ISI. The desperate nexus is modifying methods and the aim is to spread fear and stop businesses in the region. Hybrid militants target and silence voices that are speaking against separatism and against the perpetrators and instigators of violence. Security officials say that such type of target is never random. It involves watching movement patterns and finding a weak part of the routine. The spotter could be someone who is not on the police list, but has a pistol and intent to kill, just like a mercenary shooter paid to kill a target. Hence, authorities in Kashmir need to tackle the situation from multiple angles. Jammu and Kashmir police and security forces have to work in synergy as hard intelligence is required to tackle the situation. There is an urgent need to break the chain of these attacks. Let's shift our focus to Pakistan's Balochistan province, where human rights violations have become the norm. The Pakistan state and its security agencies have habitually trampled on the human rights of the Baloch people in the name of security and territorial integrity. They are often charged with treason, branded as terrorists and killed in encounters or picked by security forces at will. The Baloch political and human rights activists have demanded immediate intervention by United Nations to stop gross human rights violations in province. Take a look. The situation is grim in Balochistan, a resource-rich yet the poorest province of Pakistan. Enforced disappearances, torture and murder of political activists, intellectuals and women are rampant. According to the Commission of Inquiry on Enforced Disappearances, more than 7,000 enforced disappearances occurred in Pakistan since 2011, with over 700 enforced disappearances in 2019 alone. The Baloch, a majority of whom migrated abroad to protect their lives, are frequently raising their concerns by holding protests and organizing seminars. They want the international community, especially the United Nations, to listen to their grievances and make Pakistan accountable for its continued human rights violations against the Baloch people. Every day Pakistan abducts two or three uh, people from Balochistan, particularly the students. And also it includes the enforced disappearances, includes women, children, uh, even elderly people. And uh, they are subject to enforced disappearance by Pakistan Army and its secret intelligence. And they go missing for years and years and years. Their whereabouts are unknown to the people of Balochistan. Uh, the, there is a complete media blackout in Balochistan. Balochistan has remained tense and volatile since Pakistan annexed the autonomous Baloch state of Kalat in 1948. The common people in the region 
have been experiencing various forms of human rights atrocities at the hands of the Pakistani state. Independent journalists, doctors, and civil rights activists are being targeted by authorities. The state intelligence wing, the notorious ISI, is playing a nefarious role in such incidents. Experts believe that the missing persons may be dead or interned, locked away in illegal detention centers. The people, uh, they are resisting against the state. They are resisting against the occupation of their land. They are uh, uh, resisting against the abuse of their uh, fundamental rights. And uh, for that, they are facing these sort of consequences uh, by the state forces. Uh, the, uh, uh, because the state wish is to eliminate these people, eliminate their identity, eliminate their culture. Uh, and uh, Pakistani state only needs the land and the resources. Pakistan ranks 167th out of 170 countries in Georgetown University's Global Women, Peace and Security Index as the country witnesses widespread rights abuses against women and children. The Balochi people have faced extreme deprivation and marginalization from Pakistan, resulting in their strong desire for liberation and independence. The tension has further escalated by Chinese investments under Beijing's Belt and Road Initiative, with the funds never reaching the locals. The Baloch are clear now that the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, or CPEC as it's commonly called, gives them no additional benefit and further threatens their way of life. They are urging the international community to speak out against the atrocities as the world's silence is giving impunity to Pakistan. Since taking power in August last year, the Taliban have repeatedly expressed the expectation that the international community will recognize their authority. But the group has done nothing to demonstrate a willingness to meet the conditions put forward by Western powers and some regional states. The Taliban have repeatedly revealed a clear prioritization of maintaining their own internal cohesion and demonstrating their authority domestically. The government is made up entirely of their own leadership, excluding women and other political stakeholders while including a number of internationally sanctioned figures. A report. The people of Afghanistan are going through the darkest moments once in a generation. Now as the country is facing economic, security and political crisis. While humanitarian assistance continues to flow, aid needed for longer term development in Afghanistan was halted when the Taliban took over Kabul last August as foreign forces withdrew. Billion of dollars in Afghan reserves also remain frozen overseas as the West pushes for concessions on human rights. No country has yet recognized the Taliban as legitimate rulers of Afghanistan, mainly because of their harsh treatment of women and girls. The Islamist rulers have suspended secondary education for most teenage girls, ordered women to wear face coverings in public and barred them from traveling beyond without a close male relative. Taliban leaders who are not willing to listen to the world community are desperate to get recognition. They have called on the international community to roll back sanctions and unfreeze central bank assets in the wake of a deadly Afghanistan earthquake. The Islamic Emirate is uh, asking the world to give the Afghans their most basic right, which is the right to life, and that is through lifting the sanctions. Uh, and uh, uh, unfreezing our assets and also giving assistance after destroying lives for 20 years. The US and the world at large have been urging the hardline group to reverse some of its curbs on women and ensure inclusive governance if it wants the global community to consider the Taliban's demand for diplomatic recognition. However, Taliban leaders have rejected calls for removing the restrictions on women, insisting they are in accordance with Afghan culture and Sharia or Islamic law. Their spokespersons say they are religiously obliged to implement Islamic Sharia to counter practices that Islam prohibits. 
They have the opinion that Afghan women should not make such demands that are against the principles of Islam. The de facto rulers of Afghanistan claim that they had met all the requirements for their government to be given diplomatic recognition. When asked to explain whether the group's policies or any country is responsible for the delay in winning the legitimacy, Taliban say that the US is preventing the new government from receiving international recognition. I'll answer that question with two uh, counter questions. Uh, the one would be, is this uh, the criteria for all societies to be given the most basic right, the right to life and existence? And number two, is this rule universal? Because the United States just passed an anti-abortion law and it has laws in some states that uh, enforce public morality and uh, dress code. Despite the Taliban's promises to suppress and expel other terrorist groups, their presence in practices has helped to perpetuate the crisis in Afghanistan. The presence of ISISK and other terrorist training camps in Afghanistan has led to a lack of sufficient confidence in various countries in the Taliban. In fact, turning Afghanistan into a terrorist base and reproducing international terrorists and exporting them to the world could add to the country's multiple crises. Taliban should introspect and pay attention to the concern of security experts. Moreover, they should listen to the voice of common Afghans who are demanding basic human rights. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.